Cool. I'm here with Dr. Gillian Kenny again, and we are in our playlist on generally women in Irish medieval history and outsiders and social roles and how history affects us now and witches and all this lovely stuff, sovereignty goddesses. So we've covered a lot in the playlist. Make sure you check out the rest of it. Um, and we are covering topics that Gillian has taught for us on, which is great. But Gillian is also currently working on the history of Grania Whale, uh, Grace O'Malley in Ireland. So I thought we'd just kind of slip it in. I'm sure you'll do a class on Grania Whale at some point <laughs> for us. Yeah, sure. So, so let's preempt it. Yeah. So I have always been fascinated by her. Um, so do you want to tell us a bit about her for people who might not be familiar and um, and your work and have you discovered anything unusual and all that good stuff? Okay, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, many people will know her as the Pirate Queen. Um, so uh, basically, in a nutshell, she was born on the far west coast of Ireland into a quite small lordship. Uh, her family were kind of lords of the sea. Um, if you think they also owned land, but if you think of uh, most lords as having um, ownership of lands and dealing with that, well, they had a bit of that, but their main roving area and source of income was the sea of the west of Ireland. And anyone who's been to the west of Ireland will know quite how difficult that probably was for them. So her her name comes from um, a kind of a play uh, on on the on the um, Irish version of Bald Grania uh, because. Um, she, there's stories, lots of stories about her. There's lots of legends. Part of my uh, job is to kind of sift through the legends uh, and see what's at the, the root of it. So the idea was that uh, when she was a little uh, girl, she asked to go with her father and his um, and his sailors along the West Coast. And he said, no, of course you can't, because she had long, beautiful hair. And he said, that will get caught in the rigging, uh, Gronia. You go home and, and stay with your mother. And she went, all right. And she left the ship and shaved all her hair off and then came back and said, now can I go? <laughs> and so then he had to bring her. So that's uh, so that's Grania Whale. That's it. that's where that title comes from. So she's born into this family and she's born in a very significant period. Uh, she's born around 1530. And basically she's born into a Gaelic Irish lordship and uh, Gaelic Ireland is about to change very drastically in the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, so it is the time of plantations. It is the time of extreme colonization. Everything she knows will change. But it is also a time where in a space where Ireland is torn apart by war and conflict, that a woman like Bronya Ali finds a way to wield and uh, hold on to power. So that's very interesting kind of point about her. She becomes basically a, a lord, a chieftain, and she is, I mean, the first really properly documented woman in Irish history to do it. Even though she's never given the title, she basically rules as one. And she can do this in a time of extreme unrest. So in my studies with, with women and, and power, you often find that women can thrive at these liminal periods in history where the established order is breaking down. So even though in general it's an incredibly traumatising time, and it was for her, um, one of her children was killed. I mean, it's a horrendous time for her. She's in constant conflict with the English authorities. Um, she finds a way to basically consolidate previous husbands' power to take over some of their lands and men and to kind of amalgamate that into a greater O'Malley kind of uh, lordship that mm. she was she was to all extents and per all intents and purposes chieftain of and she in one of the worst periods of Irish history particularly the later 16th century when the Tudors were uh, enacting genocidal policies in the south and the western areas of Ireland in particular she managed to uh, die in her bed mm. um, probably aged in her 60s um, uh, on the west coast of Ireland. So she also managed to uh, die not before knowing that her son, who inherited uh, uh, Tibbet Nalung, as he was called, Theobald, or T Tibbet of the ships, that he was kind of becoming the most powerful landowner in, in the west of Ireland. So the really interesting thing about Grainne O'Malley is she's kind of the last uh, unusual gasp of, of Gaelic mm -hmm. Irish power in a woman that I you can see. And she's 
He went out with a bang and she's massively unusual because she basically ruled. Gaelic Irish law and custom did not allow female rulers. Mm. Now, of course, women exerted power. Of course, there are laws in place, but they subverted them. Mm. But she's quite open. And most of the uh, sources on her come from English sources. Uh, what's interesting about Grania is you don't see her in the Irish sources. And one theory for that is because she's so unusual and uh, and the male kind of elite, intellectual elite who navigated and used these sources didn't like her so much that she didn't appear because she's mm -hmm. something that they can't comprehend. Mm -hmm. um, so she's in English sources and she's... Uh, She's talking to uh, kind of English bureaucrats. She's representing herself as as representing the O'Malley uh, clan. So it's all really unusual, really fascinating stuff. And what I'm going to write about is her within that kind of horrendous, tumultuous time, mm. which uh, saw massive uh, destabilization of Gaelic Ireland and eventually its death. But right in the middle of it, uh, this woman who lived in this tiny lordship on the far west coast of Ireland, the edge of nowhere, mm. came out of it and became famous in her lifetime. I mean, at, you know, Elizabeth I certainly took an interest in her. Um, she was fascinated by her. There's an apocryphal legend, um, which it, it didn't happen. It happened in comes from I was a later time. I going to ask you about and, you know, that of her visiting. Everyone, everyone <laughs> likes to think it happened. So it, I think it comes from the 18th century. There's no evidence at the time right. it happened that she met um, Elizabeth I. Um, you know, she was in, in England uh, a couple of times. She probably met with, um, with Cecil. She probably met with Elizabeth's advisors. Did she meet with the Queen? We'll never really know. Uh, I think people like to think she did. But in the description of the encounter, which came from later, um, What's really fascinating about it is Gronya is presented. I mean, she speaks Latin, mm -hmm. so it speaks to, uh, you know, a developed society she came from. So that's sh shorthand for that. But also she was mesmerized at how barbaric the English were, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is a subversion. Um, classically, famously, um, she, uh, she uh, someone blew their nose, I think mm -hmm. it was, uh, into a into a handkerchief and then stood, shoved it back in their pocket. And she was appalled by this because she was like, you blow your nose, you get rid of it. What are you doing? <laughs> and it's just these little tiny touches that go, actually, mm -hmm. we're always told uh, that the, the English read the Gaelic Irish as barbaric. And again, that in itself isn't isn't particularly true. I mean, the English were colonizing forces. So to colonize, you have to other what you're doing, mm. you have to portray them as less than human mm. because otherwise your soldiers don't have the stomach for killing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's all part of that process. But yeah, she's a fascinating woman. She goes a long line of Gaelic Irish women in the past who did unusual and interesting things. I mean, she's by no means completely anomalous, but she becomes incredible. She becomes a warlord and that's unusual. Mm. So that's who mm. I'm working on at the minute. Yeah. Did she? I know uh, Richard Bingham, who was famously known mm. as the Flail of Connacht, uh, was sent over by Elizabeth around that period, and he was stationed at Tulsk, so that's where I would have come across his his particular history. Um, but obviously, then that was a staging post for the rest of Ireland. He was trying to, yeah. you know, civilize the barbaric lands of the west of Ireland, which um, were stubbornly yep. still under the the Gaelic uh, culture, and. I know that there would have been a lot of letters back. So would that be one of the sources? Did they encounter each other yeah. or? Yeah. Uh, Bingham was obsessed with her. Really? Um, he was obsessed with I never came across her. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bingham absolutely hated her. Like and hunted her down. Um, I mean, it got so bad. She herself. I mean, that's that's one of the reasons she kind of went to England the first time she wrote and said, this is appalling. It was so bad that even English administrators in Dublin were writing to to the court in London and going, "This has to stop with Bingham." Bingham well, is was, a notorious was insane, psychopath, wasn't he? he was yeah, he's a he's a he's a he's a horrendous. I mean, it's so it's a period in Irish history that latter end, especially of the 16th century, where you see the most extraordinary level of genocide. Like, there are accounts, and I I don't want to upset people, but. There are accounts of extreme levels of barbarity. I mean, involving involving children. Mm. Um, <clears throat> there are there's an account of uh, not particularly with Grania, but in the south. So there's a series of rebellions in the south of Ireland in the 16th century, the Desmond rebellions, and uh, the English response was, I mean, astonishing. It was, I yeah. mean, there's um, so you, what you do get what I always find is a disjoint is you get noted Tudor kind of um 
poets and writers like the Sydneys and uh, Edmund Spencer. And these people are savages once they get to Ireland. Mm. Spencer's calling for widespread annihilation and then traipsing over to the court and, and uh, you know, uh, mouthing off with all these delicious poems about Elizabeth I. So there's a real disjoint. They're like a savage in Ireland and then they go back in their sweetness and light. So so there's, there's, there's a, it's, a, it's a hugely traumatic, hugely terrible time for the country. But Bingham <clears throat> within that, is excessive yeah. if you're so bad that these people are complaining about you yeah that's bad so yeah. he was obsessed with her um he uh he arranged for the murder of her son he harried her constantly he erected a gallows um where she lived and said he was going to hang her on it and all her children um he comp he just devoted himself to getting her so part of the trip over was to kind of go this needs to stop it's hilarious she wrote these um articles about, you know, uh, they call it articles, these little submissions about how hard her life was. And if you know about her, you know, she she's like hard. She's hard as nails. Like she's, you know, she's a pirate <laughs> war queen and she's over in England going, oh, I'm just an old lady and just I can't <laughs> cope. Um, you know, but what's what's fascinating from my point of view, from these interactions again with English administration is she presents herself as speaking on behalf of the O'Malley's. That's very unusual. Mm -hmm. Um, So she's an extremely forceful character who's managed, and she does make an impression. There is a kind of a, there is a fascination with her, um, with, with who she is and what she represents. So in the English mindset, of course, the Irish were always that little bit exotic. Mm -hmm. um, and when you get them at court, uh, there was always that little kind of frisson of, oh, look what they're wearing or, you know, mm. they can't speak English properly. And if they spoke English, um, it would have sounded quite different mm. to the English that was spoken uh, in South southeastern England at the time. So they would have looked and sounded almost alien. Mm. Um, so she did cause a bit of a thing. Yeah, Bingham's an incredible... An incredible, horrendous character. I mean, he ended up uh, kind of getting on the wrong side of the Tudors eventually, but not before he had, I mean, just yeah. laid waste uh, to Connacht. Oh, and she was legally sanctioned, of course. Yeah. The the most oh, of war crimes. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, that's, that's part and parcel of, uh, of policy at the time. So again, what will be featured in the book? I mean, she she kind of is born at the same time of Elizabeth, as Elizabeth I and mm. she kind of dies around the same time, we mm. think, as Elizabeth I. So there's two kind of lives also in tandem. Mm. Um, one thing I will be highlighting in the book, and it's based a lot on, on fairly recent Irish scholarship, is how responsible Elizabeth was for what happened in Ireland. Mm. She's often been seen as having quite a clean pair of hands. I think it's because she was maybe a woman. No, Elizabeth no. was well aware of what no. was happening in Ireland to push forward her agenda. Um, and it is it is grist to the mill as well of, um, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the old kind of idea was that Ireland was a part of the English kind of polity and was viewed the same. No, it very much wasn't mm. because you wouldn't mm. do what you did in Ireland in Bedfordshire or Warwickshire mm. or anywhere else like that, mm. because it absolutely when there was rebellions in England, for example, the Pilgrimage of Grace, Henry VIII put them down, but with instructed his soldiers with the least amount of, of kind of force. That is not the case specifically and explicitly in the Irish situation. No. So um, it is treated very differently by successive Tudor monarchs. Absolutely. Yeah. And continued up through history. I mean, you know, through the Black and Tans, through the, the forces, the armed forces in, in Northern Ireland. And there, there has always been that excessive and... You know, when you were saying about like that, they were in court and they were very different from the savagery that they were enacting here in Ireland. Like that's that is that colonial mindset, isn't it? All over the world. And it really kind of brought it home to me, just as you were saying it there, how very real it is that the the British cut their teeth in Ireland, you know, um, with what they they learned how to suppress and oppress and, you know, they learned the genocide. They learned all of that in Ireland and then brought it to the rest of the world in so many different ways, you know. Yeah. So the lessons learned in the suppression of Ireland in the 16th and 17th centuries were exported to North America. Exactly mm. the same kind of methods are used in the suppression of the kind of First Nations people. Yeah. So Ireland is used as a kind of a kind of a practice for genocide. Mm -hmm. And yeah. in India and, as uh, well. In India. Yeah. Oh, certainly. Yeah, yeah. God, yeah. All those kind of. 
you know, <clears throat> I mean, um, uh, famine as a as a means of waging war, things like that, um, excessive punishments, um, not adhering to the so-called rules of war in terms of treatment of women and children. Yep, but just burning crops, baby. That's yep. uh, that was all just just uh, yep. wholesale kind of. It was like a like a like a test lab for all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, yeah. Well, it's really good to have. A powerful, even if slightly anomalous figure, such as Grania Whale, to be, you know, to, to know that there was a heroism, let's call it, you know, a certain brand of heroism, but like a certain you know, brand. I think she's, uh, yeah, the, the ability to spot a chance and yeah. go for it. <laughs> she was clished, as we'd say here. She's clever. <laughs> Yeah, she's uh, she certainly has her head screwed on yeah. that one. And she I think she just she just I mean, I I don't think it was uh, I think she saw ways to solidify her family's power. And as a good kind of lord, mm -hmm. that's what you mm -hmm. needed to do. And if yeah. that if that meant you had to do X to gain Y and look after your descendants, then that's what Grania did. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, some of her descendants are, are still kind of fairly wealthy and powerful today. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, Westport House was built by them. So, Absolutely. you know, the, the tactic worked. Mm -hmm. She was a good mother and mm -hmm. a very good Lord, I mm -hmm. think. Yeah, good, good. Well, I love to see it. And I really look forward to you making a class for us or teaching a class rather for us at the Irish Pagan School on this topic and of course to reading your book and to seeing you consulting on what has to be films and tv shows about <laughs> Grania Whale because I mean how I know we had the one with them um, mm -hmm. with Lucy Lawless many many years ago gosh I haven't seen that I'm gonna have to look uh, that yeah up. I don't even know if it I know if some of my reenactor friends were actually involved in the filming of it but I don't know how I, like it seemed to just fizzle I really don't know um but obviously we have a lot more history now we have a lot more uh, research available thanks to your good self and many others I'm sure and uh it it's just so ripe for like for for media oh, yeah. production isn't it it really is I don't know how they haven't I mean yeah. she's just the most incredible character um so I I mean I just don't know how they have maybe what's putting them off is the fact that she really comes into her power and she's an older woman so uh, you know maybe mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. kind of like she becomes incredibly powerful and wealthy yeah. then well so I mean I'm all for I'm... kind of a middle-aged woman going kicking at us oh, uh, like, in, in early modern Ireland so oh. <laughs> nothing wrong but there is a shift in that I mean some of the say the Melissa McCarthy you know films and things like that so maybe yeah. we're, maybe we're coming into an era where we're ready for for Grania you know we'll hold <laughs> out for that for middle-aged Grania <laughs> kicking arse absolutely, absolutely. sailing over to England and telling them what's what <laughs> I would I would watch the hell out of that that is exactly right wait can't wait for it so meanwhile, um, check the links below. Gillian may have done the class if you're watching this sometime in the future. Um, so there will be links below to all of Gillian's classes and all of her amazing knowledge that she is sharing with us through the Irish Pagan School. So thanks so much for your time again, Gillian. And uh, make sure that you check out the rest of the playlist. Uh, we have a series of these interviews and they are all fascinating, if I do say so myself, but mostly due to Gillian's knowledge and wisdom. <laughs> so thanks again. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Laura. And we'll see you next time. Slán.